Hey stats people, today we're going to explore a little more closely what this whole idea of confidence means. Uh, it's a very, very, um, well it's a thing that has a lot of misconceptions. So we're going to try to clear up what these misconceptions are. Um, and let's we're going to do this with a little bit of a simulation I guess. So let's take a look at it. In this activity, we're going to use a confidence intervals applet to learn what it means when we say 95% confident, that our confidence interval captures the true mean. I have the link up over here, and we'll go, we'll go ahead and click that. And that takes us to this curve over here. Now the instructions say that we're supposed to go to staplet.com, which we did, scroll until we see the confidence intervals applet, set the confidence level to 95%, which we've done, and set the sample size to 5. Next, click. Next, we're supposed to click sample to choose an SRS and display the resulting confidence interval. The confidence interval is displayed with a horizontal line segment and a dot representing the sample mean right in the middle of the interval. The true mean, mu, is the green vertical line. So here's that green vertical line running right down the middle. And let's click sample. And what you're going to see is these uh, tan dots, those represent the sample. And if we find the average of these tan dots, we would get this black dot. The confidence interval then would be any value that goes in, in this black line. Notice the black line intersects the green line, meaning this black line has um, one of the plausible values is the mean of the population. So what we would say is that this confidence interval successfully captures the mean of the population. So did the first confidence interval capture the true mean? Yes, it did, because the green line was inside the confidence interval. Next, repeat this process 10 times and sketch what you see on the right. Um, how many of the intervals capture the true mean? Now, as we do this, I want you to keep our confidence level in mind. We have a 95% confidence level. We've got our first um, sample, and we're going to go ahead and do nine more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How many of our samples captured the mean? Well, all of them. All of the, the green line goes through each of the black lines. So each of these confidence intervals successfully captures the mean of the distribute the mean of this of the population what excuse me so we would say 10 out of 10 times our confidence interval captured the true value of the mean that's a hundred percent of the time the next instructions are to reset and take a total of 100 confidence intervals by pushing sample for uh, sample 25 four times and then we're going to calculate how many of those 100 captured the true percentage of the mean. What was the confidence level? 95%. Let's see what happens. Okay, we're going to reset. And we're going to do sample 25. Sample 25 more for 50. 25 more is 75. And 25 more is 100. So, what did this tell me? This tells me right over here that 95% of the uh, confidence intervals successfully captured the mean. Where have I heard that 95 number before? 95% of our samples successfully captured the mean. Let me rephrase that. 95% of our confidence intervals successfully captured the mean. That's not surprising because we set the confidence level at 95%. So 
around so around 95% of the intervals should capture the mean. The next part of this is to watch the confidence intervals as we drag the confidence level from 95 to 99. What happens to the interval as the confidence level is increased and why does that make sense? Okay, let's go ahead and drag our confidence level to 99% and keep track of those uh, black bars. What happens to them? Did you notice what happened there? They got wider, didn't they? They got longer. Also, what happened to our percentage of hits? That increased to 99%. Uh, wow, I mean, does that make sense? If we set our confidence level to 99%, about 99% of the confidence levels, our confidence intervals will capture the mean. And more of them will capture the mean because the intervals get wider. More plausible values in the interval with a wider confidence interval. So the confidence intervals get wider since more plausible values are needed if we want to be more confident. More confident means bigger interval. Number five says to reset and then sample 100 times at an 80% confidence interval. And uh, then how many of the intervals capture the true mean that time? Do you have a guess on how many? Let's click Reset, change this to 80, and then sample 25. Let's sample 25. Um, sorry, we need to get to 100. So that's 25, 50, 75, 100. How many of our confidence intervals captured the mean? And what I'm seeing over here is about 76% of them. Whoa, 76%? That's not close to 80, is it? Well, maybe it's not exactly 80, but it is close enough, I would say. So, let's see, what does confidence level mean? Well, if confidence was 99%, that means 99% of the confidence intervals capture the true value of the proportion. If the confidence level was 95%, then about 95% of the confidence intervals capture the true value of the mean. I think I said proportion last time. I did mean the mean. So if we take many, many samples, then about whatever that confidence level is, whatever that percentage is of those confidence intervals are going to successfully capture the parameter. So if we have a 90% confidence level, then about 90% of the resulting confidence intervals will successfully capture the parameter. The last question for our exploration today will be to see what happens when we adjust the sample size. So we're going to change the sample size from 5 to 50 and sample for one interval. Then we're going to change it to 250 and also sample for one interval. What happens to the interval when the sample size is increased? Okay, so let's clear this off and we'll set this back to 95, that's 96, 95, and we'll set the sample size to 50. And let's take a sample. All right, uh, the, notice how the width of that interval right now. That confidence interval has a pretty small um, number set number of plausible values. Well, what happens if we change the sample size to 250? So we're just going to jack it all the way up to 250, and we're going to push sample. And whoa, maybe not sample 25. Let's just sample one, and look at how small that confident or that um confidence interval is now. We have even less plausible values. 
So it seems as though the bigger the sample size is, the smaller the confidence interval is going to be. So what we would say here is that large samples lead to smaller confidence intervals because we're more sure of the value of the parameter. So if I told you that you know we got an average of five students and we've got the number, I don't know, 82, does that give you more confidence or less confidence than I said if I said we took the sample of 100 students and we got a mean of 82 again? Of course, that larger sample is going to give you more confidence in the value of whatever it is you're measuring. And if you think all the way back to chapter 4, we always said that large samples decreases the variability. But we didn't say the variability in what. Now we can answer that question. Large samples decreases the variability in the confidence interval, which means a smaller standard deviation in the confidence interval. So think about that one more time. When we take a large sample, we decrease the variability in the confidence interval. And isn't that a really good thing for us? Isn't, doesn't it make sense now why we take large samples or larger samples or why a larger sample is preference in an experiment or in a survey? It all comes together now, doesn't it? Okay, we're going to go ahead and hit our important ideas here. And the first uh, learning target is interpreting the confidence level. So the sentence frame, I think we saw it yesterday too, or the last lesson. But if we take many, many confident level percentage confidence intervals, then we expect about whatever that confidence level of them is to capture the true parameter of whatever the context of the parameter is. And I think we use that, uh, let me scroll up, we use that right over here. If we take many, many samples, then about confidence level of them, of the resulting confidence intervals, will successfully capture that parameter. That's virtually the same thing, and if you think that's not by mistake, you're not wrong. Learning target two. What types of things will affect the margin of error? And remember, margin of error by this point should be synonymous with variability in the confidence interval. So what things will affect that margin of error? If we keep everything the same but only change the confidence level, then the margin of error is going to increase. So well, let me do that one more time. If we l keep everything else the same, and we only increase the confidence level, then the margin of error is going to increase. More confidence means more plausible values, which means bigger margin of error. And if we keep everything the same but only change the sample size, then the margin of error is going to decrease. Larger samples mean less variability in the confidence intervals. And then lastly, the margin of error will never account for bias. So if your sample inherently contains bias, that's not going to make the margin of error bigger or make the margin of error smaller. Bias is going to change where the center of that confidence interval is going to be but it's not going to change the margin of error. Remember, by definition, biased means that what you're measuring is not the uh, parameter value. So if you go back to the simulation that we did, this right here represents an unbiased sample because all of our confidence intervals are grouped around the parameter value. However, this is the way that a biased sample would look. All of our confidence intervals are grouped around something which isn't the mean of the population. So we're measuring the wrong thing, or we're systematically getting something different than the actual mean of the population. 
Okay, if we got all of that successfully digested, then we're ready to go to check your understanding. So, as part of a project on response bias, Ellery surveyed a random sample of 25 students from her school. One of the questions in the survey required students to restate their GPA out loud. Based on the responses, Ellery said that she was 90% confident that the interval from 3.14 to 3.52 captures the mean GPA for all students at her school. So interpret the confidence level. This comes exactly from our sentence frame before. So if we make many, many 90% confidence intervals, then we expect 90% of those confidence intervals to capture the true mean GPA for the students of the school. Confidence level is a success rate. It's not a percentage in the way that most people like to think about percentages. B. Explain what would happen to the length of the interval if the confidence level were increased to 99%. So let's think about that. We're going from 90 to 99%, so we're getting more confident. More confident means more plausible values. So the length of the interval would increase because increased confidence translates to more plausible values in the confidence interval. The way to get more plausible values is to increase the size of the confidence interval. Letter C is, how would a 90% confidence interval based on a sample of 200 compare to the original 90% confidence interval? So just to refresh my memory, our original sample was 25 students. So we're going from a sample of 25 to a sample of 200. If we increase the sample size, what happens? Well, if we increase the sample size, we get more sure of our measurement. So compared to the original sample of 25 students, the interval based on 200 students would be narrower since an increased sample size will decrease that margin of error. Finally for today, describe one potential source of bias in Ellery's study that is not accounted for by the margin of error. Firstly, we need to start with the statement that bias is never accounted for by a margin of error. Margin, margin of error and bias have nothing to do with each other. But we can still discuss the bias of this sample. So remember that the students were told to say their GPAs out loud. And I don't know about you, but if I tell a bunch of students to tell me their GPA and tell me so I can see their face and what they're saying, they're probably going to overstate their GPA. I mean, I get it. I would overstate my GPA if someone asked me my GPA. Uh, so, since the students are required to state their GPA aloud, it's very possible that they're going to systematically overstate their GPA. This idea of creating a systematic error is the thing that leads to a bias. I mean, if one or two students, you know, lie about their GPA because they're weird people, well, then that's not going to be a systematic overstatement of the GPA. That's just going to be one or two bad eggs. In order for this to become bias, it needs to be a systematic flaw in the sample. And that kind of does it for our Check Your Understanding. So that's our day for today. Hopefully that all made sense to you. I know it made sense to me, but that's probably not surprising to any of you. Um, so um, I'll see you guys next time and have a great day.